Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to look at our third example of a network optimization problem called the transshipment problem. If you are not familiar with network optimization problems at all and you haven't watched my transportation example video, please go do that first. I'm going to put a link to that up top here um, on the right hand side and also in the video description below. Uh, it is important that you watch that first because of some introductory concepts that I cover over there. All right, so I'm going to assume you know what happened in that video and move on to this one. So the main difference between the transportation problem and the transshipment problem is that in the transshipment problem, you have what are called transshipment nodes, which are nodes that can have arcs or arrows both coming into them and departing from them and these nodes they can you know be uh, a supplier node they can be a demand node or they can be neither they can be just plain pass-through points that neither supply nor consume anything we're going to begin with the third version of this this in which the transshipment node basically does not have any goods in it or consume anything. It is simply a pass-through point. And after we solve the problem that way, I'm going to show you how you would have to modify it in case you wanted to make the transshipment node also be either a supplier or a demand node. All right, here's a story for us to go over. Let's say there's a fast food restaurant chain that needs to ship food from two suppliers and these are going to be nodes 1 and 2 of our network, to two distribution centers, nodes 5 and 6. And the shipments out of the suppliers can be made either directly, so there's a route straight from supplier to distribution center, or it could go through two intermediate warehouses, nodes 3 and 4, and these 3 and 4 are going to be our transshipment nodes. Now, at most, 100 tons can be shipped between any two nodes of the network. And the suppliers have a capacity or a supply amount of 160 and 200 each. And the distribution centers have demands of 180 each. And this table here gives me the cost, the shipping cost per ton shipped along any arc. So, for example, to ship from node 1 to node 3, it costs um, $8 per ton, node 1 to node 4, $13 per ton, etc. If there is an empty space, it means that, oh, in this case, just 3 to 3, 3 doesn't ship to 3, right? And 4 doesn't ship to 4. But also, you can see that there is no arc, for instance, from, you know, node 5 to anybody, right? It's because the arcs are always from these guys to these guys, right? Okay, now if we were to draw a picture for this, which is helpful when we're thinking about the math part, it would look like this. So the one and two are the two suppliers. Remember the negative means supply, so node one supply is 160, node two supply is 200. Nodes five and six are the demand nodes. Notice all arrows go into them. The, this node here wants 180, this node here also wants 180. The positive number is a demand. In nodes 3 and 4, I put a zero next to them to indicate they neither supply nor consume. And notice that there are arcs going in, so node 1 and node 2 ship to node 3 as well as node 4. And there are arcs departing node 3 from 3 to 5, 3 to 6, 3 to 4. Similarly for node 4. So these two guys are the, the novelty here in the transshipment example. And we're going to see how to deal with them both in the math and in the Excel. Great. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the math for this. First of all, as um, in the transportation example that we had initially, the total supply is this plus this, right? 360. Total demand is also 360. So as of now, supply equals demand, which means we have to say that the supplier ships out everything it has. Same for this one. This demand node receives everything they want because there is enough. Same for node 6. So let's focus first on the easier 
ones because they are similar to what happened in, in the transportation example. What would be the constraints for nodes 1, 2, 5, 6? Right? Let's go to the math here. Well, uh, we have the same kinds of variables as in any network problem. We make one variable for every arc in the picture. That is, every potential shipment in your network becomes an x variable. Right? So x13, don't confuse this with x13. Uh, if you prefer, you can put a comma there. So you call this guy x1, comma 3. So x13 is how many tons get shipped from node 1 to node 3. And similarly, this is how you call the other x's. So the, the shipments out of node 1 are all the x's that begin at 1 and go somewhere, right? 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5, 1 to 6, and this 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6 equals what node 1 has. Same thing for node 2. Entering into node 5, right, from 1 to 5, from 2 to 5, 3 to 5, 4 to 5. If you look at the picture, these are all the arrows coming into node 5 equals what node 5 wants, likewise for node 6. What happens with the guys in the middle? Well, for them, you think of them as just pass-through points. You can think of the idea of conservation of energy in physics. What comes in has to be equal to what goes out. Otherwise, this node would be consuming something, right? If something goes in, that same something has to leave. If nothing goes in, nothing can leave. So we could either write what goes in equals what goes out, or we could also uh, write this in the form of what goes in minus what goes out equals zero, right? What goes in? All the x's that end at node 3, from 1 to 3, 2 to 3, 4 to 3. What goes out? All the x's that depart from node 3, 3 to 4, 3 to 5, 3 to 6, equals zero, likewise node 4, right? So the the way to handle nodes that have both arrows in and out is to break down the constraint for them as having these two pieces what is a piece coming in minus what is a piece coming out equals in this case equals zero because this node neither supplies nor consumes anything if there was a supplier demand this zero would become something else would be either the supply or the demand and this zero here would change accordingly we're going to see that in a little bit so for now this is what we have great so we could go to excel and just simply type in these formulas but typically when we go to excel we like to we like when the formulas or most of the formulas in our model follow a similar pattern because that allows us to type a smaller amount of formulas and copy a lot of them over through the different nodes and saves us time, right? And these formulas right now, the way we look at them here, they are not all following the same pattern, but there is a very simple, you know, algebraic manipulation we can make to them so that they will all look like they follow a similar pattern. And this will allow me to simply type the formula for node one and copy that through to all other nodes without having to modify it as I go. And this is what I want to do with you. The change is very, very simple. Just pay attention. The pattern I want is this idea of what goes in minus what goes out equals a number. And notice I have this in Excel here. I have the inflow of the node, the outflow of the node, and then I make the in minus out, and I make that equal to a number. So the node 3 and 4 constraints are already following that pattern, so they're good to go. Node 5 and 6, right? Uh, this piece here, this chunk here, is it's already the in of the inflow of node 5, right? Same for node 6. And if you look at the picture, there's no out from node 5. So mathematically speaking, if I want to transform this, these two constraints, the last two, into the in minus out, I simply put in minus 0, right? equals 180. So this one is easy. It's like I pretend there is a minus zero there. Great. What about these here, the first two? Well, there's no in into node one or node two, right? The part that is written here is just the out. So if I can make a fake in, I would make it zero because there's nothing in, 
minus, and I would minus this entire chunk here, right? Because this whole thing is the out. So I can put a parenthesis in front, or enclose this in parenthesis and put zero minus this whole thing in parenthesis to make it look like an n minus out formula. But because I, if I minus this side of this equality, algebra says I have to minus the other side, right? So I would say zero minus all of this equals minus 160, just because of the algebra. And that's why in Excel, you see I have a minus 160 there because I transformed this formula to make it look like an in minus the out equals a number. And that's why this became, this 160 became, became minus 160 because I negated this whole out on the left hand side of the equal sign. And the same is done with the second formula. So now all our formulas look like in minus out equal number, which is great because they only have to write them for one node. Excellent. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, if you remember from my transportation or assignment examples, we had the variables in this rectangle format. Uh, because I said, oh yeah, from here to here, from here to here, etc. And particularly in the assignment example, and I have a link to this example down there in the video description if you haven't seen it. Because not all of these arrows existed, I rule them out by saying they're very expensive in the cost part. If you look at this picture, there is there are a lot of arrows that don't exist. A lot of the arrows that go from higher numbered nodes to lower numbered nodes don't exist. So instead of me making a six by six, you know, big block of gray cells for this bigger problem, and then having to rule out a bunch of these arrows that don't exist, I'm gonna show you a different way of modeling a network problem that is not via a rectangle of variables like this, but it's with just a strip of variables, and this way would be applicable to both the trans transportation and assignment examples as well. So let's take a look here. The idea is this. I'm just going to create a gray cell for every arrow that exists in this picture. And in order to identify who is this variable, so if I click pick a gray cell here, who are you in terms of an X variable? I simply have two columns next to it saying, oh, you are the guy that goes from node 1 to node 5. So I know that this cell A6 represents my X15. That's it, right? And I have, uh, you know, named all of the others from here to here, from here to here. This way. Great. In column D, I have listed the costs. They simply come from that table that you saw earlier. These costs here. I type them here. And every of one of these arcs or roots in the problem has a capacity from the problem. If you recall, the problem statement, at most 100 tons can be shipped. So this capacity column E is... 100 because of that reason in the story. Excellent. Now let's go ahead and write the formulas. And I want to begin to make this easier to follow. I want to begin with a node that has an in and an out, right? Let's say node 3. Here's the idea. So the ins of node 3, right? How, what should go in here? If you look at, you know, where the in froms and twos are, you would agree with me that the arrows that go into node 3 would be this one, and this one, and this one. Why? Well, these are the gray cells that have a destination, the 2, right? The 2 goes into node 3, from 1 to 3, from 2 to 3, from 4 to 3. And that's why they are the inflow of node 3. Now, what I did here was kind of time consuming. It's kind of like I scanned this thing here and I picked one by one all of the gray cells that mattered for that node. And again, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, do this in a more automatic fashion. There is a formula in Excel that does exactly this for you. Essentially, what I want to happen is this. I want to scan this column C. Why column C? Because I'm looking at the flow into a node. So what matters is 
the destination of the arrow. Find me the arrows that end at node 3 because I'm looking at the flow into node 3. So I would like Excel to do this. Scan this column C. Whenever you find the name of this node that I'm looking at, currently the name of the node is node 3. Whenever you find the name of this node, give me the gray cell that is in the same row where you found the name of this node here. So I found it here, so I, I get A4. And I keep scanning, found it again, I get A8. And I keep scanning, 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 I found it again, and then I get A15, right? And the formula that does this job for us is called sum if. It's a sum if something happens. And here how it, here's how it works. You first give to sum if the range of cells that it's supposed to look at or to scan, right? So I'm telling sum if, please scan this for me and I'm going to anchor it, comma. The second parameter is what are you looking for? Well, if I'm writing the inflow of node 3, I am looking for the number 3, which is the name of that node. The number 3 is currently located, I'm not going to type a 3 here because I would like this formula to work for every node. So I'm going to refer to where the number 3 is. And if you notice, it's behind the formula here, but it's in G6, right? It's in cell G6. So I'm saying, scan this blue range here. Look for the number that is in cell G6, which is the number 3, comma. When you find it, and you're going to find it three times, you're going to find it once here, once here, and once here. When you find it, give me the cell in the same row where you found the number 3, but that is in column here, in this column A range here. Okay. So the third parameter is where do you go to grab a cell when you find the thing that you are looking for? So look in the blue area, look for the number 3. When you find it, go to the pink area in the same row where you found the number 3 as many times as you found it. And give me an add in here in this cell H6. Add in here those cells from the pink area. Okay, And this is essentially going to write inside H6 what I had written before. It's going to find A4. It's going to find A8. And it's going to find a15, because these are the three times it finds the number three in column C. Okay, great. So if you understood this, uh, let's try to write the outflow version of this. Well, the outflow version is now is very similar with a small change. Now I'm, I want to find out where are all the arrows that depart from or begin at node 3, not the ones that end at node 3. So I do another sum if, and instead of looking for the number 3 in the in column C, which is the destination, I'm going to look for the number 3 in column B, because I want to know where are the arrows that begin at node 3, that depart from node 3. Because this is the outflow of the node, right? The arrows at the part. So look in the blue area. What are you looking for? I am looking for the name of this node, which is in G6. And once you find it, where do you go grab the variables? Well, the variables are always in the same place. So this third parameter is identical as before, as is the second parameter, which is where the name of the node is. Notice, one last comment comment is I anchored the blue and the pink in both cases, but I did not anchor the reference to G6. Why? Because when I copy this formula to the other nodes, they are all going to look in the same place, but their names are going to be different, right? So when I copy this to node 2, I would like G6 to become G5, so that I look for the number 2 instead of looking for the number 3. Great. So if I have the in and the out, well, the in minus out is simply the difference, one minus the other. And 
this cell J6 contains exactly what we have right here. Is the sum of the x's for arcs that enter node 3 minus the sum of the x's for arcs that depart from node 3. That's exactly what's in J6 right now. Because we made this with the SUMIF formula that is generic, all we have to do now is we could select these three cells and copy them to the other nodes. Copy downward, copy upward, and we're done. So notice, because I transformed my formulas, all of them into the pattern in minus out equal number, I was able to do the job for one of the nodes and simply copy through to everybody else. Imagine if you had a network with hundreds or thousands of nodes, right? You don't want to be doing the same thing over and over. All right, so the last thing we need for this to work is to calculate the cost. So if you remember from here, the cost is simply take the shipments you made, however many tons you shipped, times the unit cost per ton. And then repeat the next arc. Did you ship anything from node 1 to node 4? If so, every one of those tons costs $13. So this is a number times variable, number times variable, which is our friend sum product. I take all the shipment variables, multiply them with the shipment costs per ton. And that gives me that expression for the objective. Good. And then we just we can just go to solver now and do our usual thing. The objective cell is the cost here in H11. It's minimized because it's cost. The variables are the ones in gray. Okay. And the constraints are going to be the following. The ins minus outs of all my nodes should equal these numbers. And remember, this is all equal because supply matches demand. We're going to see in a second what if it was not the case. And besides the node constraints, right? If you go back to the math here, what else do we have? We have these six node constraints plus here for every variable, it's between zero and a hundred. A hundred is a capacity. The greater than zero is accomplished by checking that box in the solver window, but the less than a hundred we have to do. So if we go back to the, the oops, I might have uh, caused myself a problem here. Let's see, I'm gonna minimize these things, great. We want to add one more constraint, which is the following. This part here, I'll delete all that. Make sure I didn't, okay. Cancel this, do it again, easier. I want to say every X variable is at most uh -huh. Okay, so now we have this confirming. The constraints are these cells in column J equal to the cells in column L. We have that here. And all the X variables at the most, 100. We have that here. Good. And this makes the X variables no negative. And we always change this to the linear programming solver because we're all dealing with linear constraints. And at this point, we can solve this. Let's see. Great, we found a solution. Let's quickly take a look at this. This is what ha what's happening. Remember node one had 160, right? It sent 100 to three and 60 to five. Node two had 200. It sent 100 to node four and 100 to node 6. So we see that node 1 shipped out everything and node 2 did as well. Node 3 received what? 100 from node 1, right? What did it do? It took that 100 and split it. 20 of it, it sent to 5, and 80 of it, it sent to 6. So notice node 3 got 100 in, 100 out, as we wanted and as was necessary. Node 4 received 100 from node 2, so 100 in, 
and it took the whole hundred and sent it to node five. So four, a hundred in, a hundred out. Great. Node five, what did it do? It got uh, 60 from node one. It got 20 from node three, that's 80. And 100 from node four, 180. It got the whole 180 it wanted. Node six, if we look here, it got 100 from node two and 80 from node three. So it got 180 as it wanted. We could also check uh, what we just did together uh, could be done via this part here. Node one, the out is the 160 into 200. Node three, so in equals out, right? In nodes five and six, it just has the in. This is the cheapest way to move these goods um, in this network, and it's going to cost you nine thousand and eighty dollars to do it. Okay, so this is a transshipment problem. Uh, let me just briefly go over some small modifications of this. What if total supply was greater than total demand? Well, let's go back to the math. If supply is greater than demand, as we saw before, I could still write the demand nodes with equality because I know there's enough, but the supply nodes, I'm not going to write equal because there's a lot of supply. So I'm going to write you ship out less than or equal to what you have, right? at the most what you have for both of them. One detail, would you make the symbol here less than or equal? The answer is no, because recall that we flipped this by putting minus on one side, minus on the other. That's why we have the minus 160. So if this symbol was originally a less than or equal, when we minus both sides of that inequality, the less than or equal flips to be a greater than or equal. So if there was more supply than demand, this should be a greater than or equal because we flipped that formula by minusing both sides of it. So don't forget that detail. If there was more demand than supply, well, supply could stay at equal because why would we not ship everything out since we are already behind? But demand, we cannot say equal because there isn't enough. So we're going to say what the demand nodes are going to receive is less than or equal to what they want. Because this formula here was not uh, flipped, right? we didn't do a minus on both sides of it, if this is a less than or equal, it can become straight up a less than or equal here, okay? Unlike the constraint for the supply nodes. Great, we dealt with that. And finally, what do we do if the transshipment nodes have a supply or a demand? This is an easy way to think about it, I think. If, let's see node three, if node three is a consumer, right? So in addition to being a pass-through point, it has a demand, in which case it's like in this picture here, instead of having a zero, it would have a positive number, let's say a plus 10, right? It wants to eat 10 things. Well, where does that 10 go? You can think about it this way. If I know 3 am a consumer, what I consume has to be coming out of what I am receiving, right? Because currently I am receiving this much here and I'm taking all of that and shipping out to other nodes. But if I myself want to consume, it's like what comes in has to be enough to both fulfill my consumption and for me to give to other nodes. So we can think of that 10 as being part of the out of node 3 because it's something that node 3 is taking out of what it is receiving. So if node 3 had a demand amount, you could put that number inside this parenthesis together with the x's that are going out to represent the consumption. Now, because everything inside this parenthesis is negated, you could take that number, because that number on the left-hand side is a negative number, you can move that number to the other side as a positive number. So if node 3 had a demand of 10, you could go in here and replace this with a positive 10. All right? 
what about the supply situation? Let's say node 4 supplies. Node 4, let's say there, there will be a negative number next to it. Let's say a minus 5. It also supplies 5 units. Well, the reasoning is reversed. If node 4 supplies, it's like what node 4 has to give is more than what it was before. Because before node, node 4 could supply, the amount it could give was only the amount it was receiving because it didn't have a supply of its own. But now that it has a supply of its own, it's like it, what it can give equals what it receives from others plus its own supply. So you can think of that, for example, in our case here, I said node 4 supplies 5. You can think of that supply of 5 as joining what's coming into node 4. So 5 plus these incoming shipments will equal what goes out, right? So the out gets taken out of the 5 that node 4 provides by itself plus the other shipments that node 4 got from nodes, other nodes in the network. So that if so, if 4 had a supply of 5, that 5 would come together with the in part of 4. But because this is a plus 5 on the left-hand side of this equation, it gets moved to the right-hand side of the equation as a negative 5. So if a transshipment node is also a supplier, you put the supply amount on the right-hand side as a negative. Okay, so if 3 consumed 10 and 4 provided 5, this is what you would change the zeros to. Okay? So it's kind of an inter interesting rule. If, if uh, a node is a supplier in this in minus out pattern of the formulas, the supply amounts appear on the right as negatives, as you see here, and the demand amounts or the consumption amounts appear on the right-hand side as positives. That's another way of uh, remembering it. Great. And the rules for flipping these symbols to less than or greater than would apply likewise for the transshipment nodes in the same fashion as I explained them for the demand and supply nodes, okay? In case supply and demand don't match. All right, so this is all I had to say for the transshipment problem. I hope this was helpful. Um, and I'll see you guys again in the next video. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.